Greetings, brothers and sisters, in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Before watching this, I urge you to watch part 2 and part 5. It will give you a very detailed groundwork. Without watching them and totally understanding them, it would make it that much harder to understand this video. So stop this video and click the links below. The hexagram is an ancient symbol representing worship of pagan gods and used for summoning demons. It has embedded 666 and relates to the worship of Saturn. It was adopted by Solomon when he practiced witchcraft worship as the seal of Solomon, falsely attributed to David as the Star of David, which in itself is a taboo. The Rothschilds not only funded and was behind the birthing of Israel in 1948, the Rothschilds also adopted the symbol for their crest on their red shield, and which dubbed as their surname Red Shield. When they petitioned for Israel, symbols were considered like an olive leaf or candlestick. But they went with the Rothschilds' influence since they had stake in the land. In the book of Amos, chapter 5, verse 26, But ye have borne the tabernacle of your Moloch, and chewen your images. The star of your God, Israel, which ye made yourself. In the book of Acts 7, verse 43, Yea, ye took up the tabernacle of Moloch and the star of your god Repham. Figures which ye made to worship them, I will carry you away beyond Babylon. The symbolic purpose of this hexagram is to bewitch, beguile, to focus, to put a hex on the majority of the churches which is obviously evident today and because many are hexed and it's going to require four things for you to come out of her spell. Number one, always prepared and open-minded for correction. Number two, to always have a desire to refine and grow in knowledge no matter how unpopular it is. Number three, your love and dedication to the Word of God. And number four, a good in-depth study. Before we get into this teaching, it's really important to understand that the generational or gene narrational bloodline of the Israelites was once described as God's bride. An infallible Bible teaching is found in part two. And here are some verses for you to look up in your own time. Genesis 3.15 The woman and her seed. The woman is symbolic for the generational bloodline of the Israelites. And it's through the genetic bloodline of Abraham, this woman will eventually give birth to the seed. That seed, which is Jesus Christ. So let's make this clear. Israel in her youth was obedient to God and the covenant between God and the Israelites was for all members of the body that consist of the 12 tribes of Israel. If one body part sinned, the whole body would be punished. We see one of many examples with Achan's family. And because the whole body of Israel couldn't keep their side of the deal to stay obedient, God gave her a bill of divorce. The prophecy of the birth of Jesus Christ we see in Genesis 3.15 and the birth of the blessed seed of Abraham was still in the pipelines whom God preserved unto himself a special remnant from that divorced body. A remnant that remained obedient to his law, and ultimately a remnant that didn't have offsprings to Nephilim, like the rest did. 
because again Christ cannot be birthed through a polluted bloodline. And in this teaching I will be only exposing the spirit of that woman that God divorced. So to make this clear when I say jealous ex-wife that'll be the key word that will represent the spirit that is driving Israel today. It will represent the spirit of divorce Israel, an ancient spirit that has beguiled the majority of the churches, a spirit that has killed God's prophets, a spirit that has fornicated with the kings of the earth, a wife that the majority of them are the offsprings of Nephilim. As a result, the sins their fathers made. Did God fulfill all the lands promised to Abraham and his descendants? But first, let's look at the promise. Genesis 13, 14 to 15, And the Lord said unto Abraham, After that Lot was separated from him, Lift up now thine eyes, and look from the place where thou art northward, and southward, and eastward, and westward. Verse 15, For all the land which thou seest, to thee I will give it, and to thy seed forever. Genesis 3.15, For all the land which thou seest, to thee will I give it, and to thy seed, keyword, forever. Joshua 14.9, And Moses swore on that day, saying, Surely the land thereon thy feet have trodden shall be thine inheritance, and thy children's forever. Okay, here's the reason. Because thou hast wholly followed the Lord my God. Okay, that's the reason. Okay, the obedience to the seed. Singular, not plural. That seed which is Jesus Christ. Paul makes this crystal clear in Galatians 3.16. Now to Abraham and his seed were the promises made. He said not, and to seeds, as in plural, as of many, but as of one, and to thy seed, which is Christ. This is where the majority of the churches go wrong. Because to them, 1948 is accepted because they have been taught that the promised land is a forever covenant. And they don't realize that all those forever covenants between Abraham and his descendants were in fact, here it is, conditional. In other words, they would inherit the land forever if as a whole, they would stay obedient to God. Now the conditions to inhabit the land, the key word here is the word if. Deuteronomy 11, 26-28 Behold, I set before you this day a blessing and a curse. A blessing if ye obey the commandments of the Lord your God, which I command you this day, and a curse if you will not obey the commandments of the Lord your God, but turn aside out of the way which I command you this day to go after other gods which ye have not known. Deuteronomy 28 verse 63 And it shall come to pass that as the Lord rejoice over you to do you good and to multiply you, so the Lord will rejoice over you to destroy you and to bring you to naught. And ye shall be plucked from off the land whither thou goest to possess it. Deuteronomy 28, 15, but it shall come to pass, here's the key word, if thou wilt not hearken unto the voice of the Lord thy God, to observe, to do all his commandments and his statutes, which I command thee this day, that all these curses shall come upon thee and overtake thee. Deuteronomy 30, verse 17 to 18, but, here's the key word, if, thine heart turn away, so that thou wilt not hear, but shalt be drawn away, and worship other gods, and serve them, I denounce unto you this day, that ye shall surely perish, 
and that ye shall not prolong your days upon the land whether thou possessest it over Jordan to go to possess it. Deuteronomy 8, 19 to 20, And it shall be, here's the key word, is the condition word, if thou do not all forget the Lord thy God and walk after other gods and serve them and worship them, I testify against you this day that ye shall surely perish. As the nations which the Lord destroyeth before your face, so shall ye perish, because ye would not be obedient unto the voice of the Lord your God. Okay, so we have five, there's more, but five verses that state that all forever covenants between God and Israel were purely conditional. So let's make this crystal clear. All those forever covenants were purely conditional conditional. Now let's prove first of all that God fulfilled everything he promised to Israel. The offsprings of Abraham will be as many as the stars of heaven and sand upon the seashore. Genesis 22 verse 17 that in blessing I will bless thee and in multiplying I will multiply thy seed. Okay key word here as the stars of heaven and as the sand which is upon the seashore and thy seed shall possess the gate of his enemies did abraham's offspring being compared to the stars of heaven and as the sand which is upon the seashore already come to pass yes it did first kings chapter 4 verse 20 judah and israel keyword here were as in past tense okay judah and israel were many as the sand which is by the sea and multitude eating and drinking and making merry deuteronomy 1 8 10 behold i have set the land before you go in and possess the land which the lord swore unto your fathers Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, to give unto them and to their seed after them. And I spake unto you at that time, saying, I am not able to bear you myself alone. The Lord your God hath multiplied you, and behold, ye, who the Israelites, are this day, not talking about 1948, as the stars of heaven for multitude. Uh, the book of Deuteronomy chapter 10 verse 22 thy fathers went down into Egypt with three score and ten persons and now okay in their day this is not talking about 1948 and now the Lord thy God hath made thee as the stars of heaven for multitude yeah, Deuteronomy 28 verse 22 and ye shall be left few in number where else ye, who, the Israelites, key word, here it is, were, as in past tense, it didn't say will be, as the stars of heaven for multitude, because thou wouldest not obey the voice of the Lord thy God. The body of the Israelites was condensed to a few. Okay, that's that special remnant. Keep in mind, very important, that all covenant promises was originally made to the whole body of Israel. And God gave the whole body of Israel a bill of divorce because she broke her forever covenant with God. However, God did reserve unto himself a remnant from that body. Therefore, Genesis 3.15, and the seed, which is the same seed of Abraham, would still be active. In the book of Genesis 12, 3, I will bless them that bless thee, and curse him that curses thee. And in thee, Abraham, shall all families of the earth be blessed. Through the fruit of Abraham's loins, the descendants of Abraham, or the offsprings of Abraham, the seed Jesus Christ, or the promised seed of the woman that we see in Genesis 3, 15, 
that sea traveled through the loins of Abraham, Isaac, David, which ultimately was birthed through Mary. It was a spiritual seed that would eventually impregnate Virgin Mary, the prophecy spoken in Genesis 3.15. Then Mary birthed this seed that paved the way for all families of the earth to be blessed. Salvation for all that call upon the name of that seed. The milk and honey. Exodus 3.17 And I have said I will bring you up out of the affliction of Egypt unto the land of the Canaanites and the Hittites, the Amorites, the Perizzites, the Hevites and the Jebusites unto a land flowing with milk and honey. Did the fulfillment of the milk and honey already come to pass? Yes, it did. Jeremiah 11.5 that I may perform the oath which I have sworn unto your fathers to give them a land flowing with milk and honey. Okay, here it is. As it is this day. I'm not talking about these days. I'm not talking about 1948. As it is this day. Then answered I and said, So be it, O Lord. Deuteronomy 26, 15, Look down from thy holy inhabitation, from heaven, and bless thy people Israel, and the land which thou hast given us, okay, has, keyword, has given us, past tense, not 1948, as thou swore unto our fathers, a land that floweth with milk and honey. Okay, God has fulfilled all promises made between God and Abraham and his descendants, the Israelites. In the book of Joshua 21, verse 43 to 45, And the Lord gave unto Israel all, not some, not five percent, but all, the land which he swore to give unto their fathers. Okay, the covenant between God and Abraham. And they possessed it, all of it, and dwelt therein, and the Lord gave them rest about, according to all that he swore unto their fathers. And there stood not a man of all their enemies before them. The Lord delivered all the enemies into their hand. There failed not aught of any good thing which the Lord had spoken unto the house of Israel. All came to pass. In the book of Joshua 23, verse 14 to 15. And behold, this day, not 1948, but those days, I am going the way of all the earth, and you know in all your hearts and in all your souls that not one thing hath failed of all the good things which the Lord your God spoke concerning you. Keyword, all are come to pass unto you, unto Israel, and not one thing hath failed thereof. Therefore it shall come to pass that as all good things are come upon you, which the Lord your God promised you, so shall the Lord bring upon you all evil things, until he have destroyed you from off this good land, which the Lord your God hath given you. Now that we have established infallible understanding that, that all forever covenants between God and the Israelites were purely conditional and that every single promise made between God and the Israelites had fully come to pass already, the problem is the majority of the churches have been teaching that the everlasting covenant is still active to why the churches applaud and justify Israel killing thousands of innocent lives to regain land using scriptures that have already come to pass. The next question is, did the regathering of all scattered Israels come to pass already? That is the question. The prophesied regathering of the Israelites back to their land. Jeremiah 16, 14-15 Therefore, behold, the days come, saith the Lord, that it shall no more be said, the Lord liveth, that brought up the children of Israel out of the land of Egypt, 
But the Lord liveth, they brought up the children of Israel from the land of the north, and from the lands whither he had driven them, I will bring them again into their land that I gave unto their fathers. So, okay, so we're looking at the regathering back into the land. Jeremiah 29 verse 14, And I will be found of you, saith the Lord, I will turn away your captivity, and I will gather you from all nations and from all the places whither I have driven you, saith the Lord. I will bring you again into the place whence and cause you to be carried away captive. There's more verses regarding the regathering of the Israelites to their land. Also, there's a verse that Israel will be born in one day and the dry bones coming back, in which the majority of the churches teach was fulfilled in 1948. Isaiah 66 verse 8. Who hath heard such a thing? Who hath seen such things? Shall the earth be made to bring forth in one day? Or shall a nation be born at once? For as soon as Zion travailed, she brought forth her children. Israel was regathered and was born in one day by the decree of King Cyrus. In the book of Ezra 1, 1 to 2, now in the first year of Cyrus king of Persia, that the word of the Lord by the mouth of Jeremiah might be fulfilled. Okay, so what did the book of Jeremiah say? Jeremiah 29, 14, And I will bring you again into a place whence I caused you to be carried away captive. Now all evangelical movements or pro-Israel movements use this verse of Jeremiah for 1948. Okay, but you're going to find out that it wasn't so. Now we carry on in the book of Ezra. Stirred up the spirit of Cyrus, king of Persia, that he made a proclamation throughout all his kingdom, and put it also in writing, saying, Thus saith Cyrus, king of Persia, The Lord God of heaven hath given me all the kingdoms of the earth, and he hath charged me to build him an house at Jerusalem. Okay, the announcement and handwriting of King Cyrus to rebuild the house of Jerusalem was followed up by releasing of the Israelites from exile to return back to their own land. The decree and handwriting of King Cyrus fulfills the nation of Israel being born in one day. In the 1947 decree announcement from the United Nations to make Israel a state again in 1948, the same goes for the decree and handwriting from King Cyrus. The regathering of Israel to their land from exile also fulfills the prophecy of the dry bones coming to life we see in the book of Ezekiel 37. All three, a nation birthed in one day, the regathering of the Israelites to their land and the dry bones coming to life was all fulfilled through King Cyrus. We carry on in the book of Ezra 2.1. Now these are the children of the province that went up out of captivity of those which had been carried away, whom Nebuchadnezzar, the king of Babylon, had carried away into Babylon. And came again unto Jerusalem and Judah, every one, every one unto his city. Okay, every person unto his city returned back to Israel. As you read further, it talks about all the tribes of Israel returning back to their land. A verse to confirm this is found in Nehemiah. chapter 7 verse 73. So the priests and the Levites and the porters and the singers and some of the people and the Nethanims and all Israel dwelt in their cities. And when the seventh month came, the children of Israel were in their cities. Nehemiah 11 verse 3. Now these are the chief of the province that dwelt in Jerusalem. But in the cities of Judah dwelt every one in his possession in their cities. To wit Israel, the priests and the Levites and the Nethanans and the children of Solomon's servant. 
in the book of Ezekiel 39 verse 28. Then shall they know that I am the Lord their God, which caused them to be led into captivity among the heathen. But I have gathered them unto their own land, and have left none, keyword, and have left none of them who the Israelites any more there. Also, the majority of the churches have been teaching using Genesis 12.3, that God will bless those that bless the current Israel and God will curse those who come against the current Israel. Genesis 12, 3, And I will bless them that bless thee and curse him that curses thee. And in thee, Abraham, shall all families of the earth be blessed. This verse is not referring to the current Israel. This verse is referring to the Israelites that once was a chaste virgin or wife unto God. The reason for protecting the bloodline of the Israelites or his wife by way of law, God winning all their battles, giving each soldier supernatural strength and power to chase a thousand men, supernaturally departing the sea for them and to give the Israelites an incentive, the milk and the honey, as an exchange for their obedience. And the milk and the honey as an exchange for their obedience is because that bloodline was to give birth to Jesus Christ. Why wouldn't God protect the bloodline of Abraham, Isaac, Jacob and David? Why wouldn't God supernaturally protect that favoured bloodline when that bloodline would ultimately fulfil Genesis 3.15, the seed of the woman, and Genesis 22.18, the seed of Abraham, who would bless all nations of the earth. The Israelites were given the law to keep her a chaste virgin, genetically pure unto her husband, and not to have offsprings to Nephilim that lived amongst the Gentiles, because again, Christ cannot be birthed from a Nephilim bloodline. That's the whole purpose of the bloodline of the Israelites. So ask yourself this question, when the Israelites fulfilled all that is required of them to do, giving birth to Jesus Christ and starting what we call today as the church, what other purpose besides spreading the gospel do the Israelites have now and why continually bless a specific bloodline that has fulfilled its role? To continue in blessing Israel would mean that Jesus Christ isn't born yet. In the book of Matthew 1 17, so all the generations from Abraham to David are 14 generations, and from David unto carrying away into Babylon are 14 generations, and from the carrying away into Babylon unto Christ are 14 generations. This verse is specifically talking about the generational bloodline of the Israelites. Ask yourself this question. Why didn't this verse say, and from Christ to 1948? It doesn't say anything about the Israelites' generational bloodline leading to 1948. The reason why it doesn't mention it that way is because the Israelites have already fulfilled their purpose. That purpose was to give birth to Jesus Christ and to evangelize the Gentiles, which gave birth to a new bride that consists of both Jew and Gentile. And another reason why it did not say from Christ to 1948 is because the birth of Israel in one day, the dry bones coming to life, and the regathering of Israel had already come to pass in the book of Ezra. And if that be true, what is 1948 all about then? We will get to this very soon. There is, however, one verse that I could personally find in the New Testament that explains Israel's return in 1948. But it's not the Israel of God. What manifested in 1948 was the spirit of God's jealous ex-wife. I will expand on this soon. Now the question is, why is Lucifer mimicking scripture 
that has already been fulfilled? Why is he determined in brainwashing the whole world to focus only on Israel for end times prophecy? Brainwashing the churches to believe that it's okay to kill and torture innocent lives to gain land that has already been fulfilled. Why are the churches focusing on Israel for end times events, like a third temple, the Antichrist standing in a literal temple declaring himself that he is God, the Antichrist ending the literal daily animal sacrifices, when we now know that the temple the Antichrist wants to own is not a temple made with hands. When we all now know that the Antichrist wants to sit in a temple he currently does not own, that temple that is you and I. When we now know that the daily sacrifice, singular, doesn't say daily sacrifices, is ceased for those who have taken the abomination. These literal lies have brainwashed the majority of the churches who look to Israel for end times events. Israel's place in prophecy, the focus on Israel. Well, the Bible does say that there is a special blessing that goes to the support of Israel. The blessing of blessing Israel brings a supernatural prosperity to the person, to the church, to the nation that truly blesses the Jewish people. So there is validity and value in supporting Israel and the Jewish people and the Jewish state. Absolutely. God said, I'll bless those that bless you. I'll curse those that curse you. So I'm gonna invite you to do that very thing. Grab your Bibles. Let's get into what God says about Israel. In a word, all eyes on Israel. (laughs) All eyes are on Israel. Israel, if you want to see end time prophecy fulfilled, the first place you need to look is Israel. And because none of these deceiving events happened the way they were taught, and Israel was chosen to be the fastest as per population in the world to receive the abomination. Israel is currently going the hardest and fastest with the highest vaccination rate in the world. It's plain and obvious that the rest of the churches around the world that look to Israel would follow suit. If you have not figured it out by now, the current Israel that was planted in 1948 and funded by the Rothschilds, I must add, was planted there to be at the forefront to be that example to the world regarding the abomination. The enemy needed a distraction, and Israel was that distraction. The spirit of this jealous ex-wife and her Schofield and Derby pro-Israel evangelical preacher of rapture teachings has beguiled the majority of the churches and is broadly responsible for those who were deceived in taking the abomination. Restrictions have eased across Israel, with open-air markets and shopping centres welcoming customers back. Well, it's about time. We had a long time uh, at home and uh, it wasn't easy. But only those with a green badge or vaccination passport will be allowed to go into businesses like movie theatres, swimming pools and gyms. And we can start to work out again. And let's hope it will stay like this and we don't go back to the way it was before. The partial reopening is a big moment for Israel, which has been inoculating its population at a blistering rate. Since the vaccination program began two months ago, almost half the population of more than 9 million have received their first dose. We are now uh, finally in a moment uh, where we need to think uh, how to return to what we call maybe the new normal. The Green Badge Scheme is closely watched as a possible model model for how other countries might reopen. Israel has just passed this green passport system. Do you understand what this is? This is a program where they are only allowing the people that have been vaccinated to participate in society, to go to restaurants, to go to malls, to go to theaters, to go to sporting events. That's right. 
If you do not submit to this wicked, demonic, tyrannical agenda, if you choose to say, you know what, I'm not ready to participate in this experimental program, then you are now considered a second class citizen in the country. country. They're literally threatening. Do you know that the mainstream ministers, people in the government of Israel, high level government officials are literally saying, hey, you should send the police to the people's houses that aren't being vaccinated. Release the names of the people that aren't being vaccinated. This is wicked, demonic tyranny. Are you kidding? Not man mandatory in Israel. However, this COVID-19 shot is, well, it's just short of it. Meaning they say that it's not a have to and it's not a force. But the reality on the ground is, is people are losing their jobs if they're in the health, um, if they're doing any sort, sort of health professional there are many, many different um, places where people are, 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 are told that you vaccinate or you're out. You told me something uh, before in this audio file about people wearing a kind of a badge around their wrist, uh, the free pass or something like that. What is that all about? It's called the green passport. We're not told to wear it, but what they have done is they have essentially overnight created a second class citizenry, a, a, a true medical apartheid that is uh, disallowing healthy, law abiding, tax paying citizens from entering their places of culture um, if they do not participate in this experiment. It's that it's that simple. You literally we've been told there are people who have been kicked out of their choirs, out of their pools, out of their gyms. Um, like I said, there's incredible social pressure and division between families. It's a very bad situation here. They're making people wear a, a ankle bracelet. It's absolutely insane. But meantime, we just keep fighting, you know? fighting as much as we can so we need everybody's help because whatever happens here will happen everywhere it will happen everywhere so we're fighting for ourselves and we're fighting for the whole world but we need help for we need every bit every those of us in israel we understand that we are being used as a model for the rest of the world the fig tree this is the only verse I could find in the New Testament regarding the return of Israel. But it's not the Israel of God. In the book of Matthew 21, 18 to 19. Now in the morning as he returned into the city, who Jesus, he hungered. And when he saw a fig tree in the way, he came to it and found nothing thereon but leaves only he said unto it let no fruit grow from thee henceforth forever and presently the fig tree withered away now the fig tree has always been symbolic for israel although jesus christ did many marvelous miracles in his time the fig tree was the only thing he put a curse on. So much so, in real time, the fig tree withered and died in the sight of those who witnessed it. Key words to take away from this verse is, Let no fruit grow on thee, on Israel. Let no fruit grow on thee, henceforth, here's another key word, forever. And this time, it doesn't come with any conditions to remarry the old bride. Now, here is a verse that mentions the 1948 Israel. Matthew 24, verse 32. Now, learn a parable of the fig tree. Okay, Jesus Christ was asked the question, what will be the signs of the end of the age? Okay, when this branch is yet tender and putteth forth leaves ye know that summer is nigh 
This is talking about 1948. It kind of sounds like this. When you see the manifestation of the old jealous bride, know that summer is near. Notice here, it says, putteth forth leaves. It doesn't say anything about fruit. This verse didn't butt heads with Matthew 21, 18 to 19, where it states that no fruit will grow from thee forever. The return of the old angry bride will only grow leaves. A tree with no fruits of the spirit, no genuine bloodline because it's not about ethnicity anymore. There is no such thing as Jew and Gentile in the eyes of God. Jew and Gentile have become one new man. In the book of Revelation chapter 2 verse 9, And I know thy works and tribulation and poverty, but thou art rich, and I know the blasphemy of them which say they are Jews and are not, but are the synagogue of Satan. Many say they are ethnic Jew, but they are not. The reason why it says they are not confirms that ethnicity or the partition war between the Jew and Gentile is now obsolete, thanks to the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ. To say in one's heart that Jew and Gentile are still separate is to say that the power of Jesus Christ's death and resurrection to make both Jew and Gentile one man is to say that Jesus Christ has not died on the cross at all, which in turn would say that Jesus is not the Son of God, which is the spirit of Antichrist. Who is the harlot in the book of Revelation? Revelation chapter 17 verse 1 to 7 and there came one of the seven angels which had the seven vials, and talked with me, saying unto me, Come hither, I will show unto thee the judgment of the great whore that sitteth upon many waters, with whom the kings of the earth have committed fornication, and the inhabitants of the earth have been made drunk with the wine of her fornication. Now, who was the whore that committed fornication with the kings of the earth? Let's get some scriptures. In the book of Ezekiel 16, 29 to 30, Thou, who Israel, hast moreover multiplied thy fornication in the land of Canaan unto Chaldea, and yet thou wast not satisfied herewith. How weak is thine heart, said the Lord God, seeing thou doest all these things, the work of an imperious, whorish woman. So we see here Israel fornicating with the land of Canaan. And remember that these nations that Israel fornicated with, they are Nephilim nations mixed with Gentiles. In the book of Ezekiel 16:28, Thou, who, Israel, hast played the whore also with the Assyrians, because thou was unsaturable. Yea, thou hast played the harlot with them, and yet couldst not be satisfied. So Israel has played the whore or fornicated with the with the Assyrians. Ezekiel sixteen fifteen, but thou who Israel didst trust in thine own beauty, and played the harlot because of thine renown and pourest out of thy fornication on every one that passed by. In the book of Ezekiel 16 verse 35, Wherefore, O harlot, who? God is talking to Israel. Hear the word of the Lord. In the book of Jeremiah 2 verse 20 to 23, For of old time I have broken thy yoke, and burst thy bands, and thou saidest, Who's thou? Israel. I will not transgress, when upon every high hill and under every green tree thou wanderest, playing the harlot. Yet I had planted thee a noble vine, a holy right seed. The seed is genetics. How then art thou turned into a degenerate plant of a strained vine unto me? 
Okay, so the degenerate plant represents the divorced Israel, the spirit of this jealous ex-wife. She has become a degenerate plant. For thou, though, wash thee with nitre, and take thee much soap, yet thine iniquity, okay, is marked before me, saith the Lord God. How canst thou say, I am not polluted? Okay, so how can Israel say that she is not polluted? I have not gone after Balaam. How can she say that when she did? See thy way in the valley, know what thou hast done. Thou art a swift dromedary, traversing her ways. Okay, so it's obviously clear who the whore is that committed fornication with the kings of the earth. It was Israel. This is the reason why God divorced her. We carry on in the book of Revelations, chapter 17, we're at verse 3. He carried me away in the spirit into the wilderness, and I saw a woman sit upon a scarlet colored beast, full of names of blasphemy, having seven heads and ten horns. And the woman was arrayed in purple and scarlet color, and decked with gold and precious stones and pearls, having a golden cup in her hand, full of abomination and filthiness of her fornication. And upon her forehead was a name written, Mystery Babylon the Great. Okay, so this jealous ex-wife has the title, Mystery Babylon the Great, written in her forehead we carry on the mother of harlots and abominations of the earth and i saw the woman drunken with the blood of the saints and with the blood of the martyrs of jesus now let's see if we can dig out some scriptures regarding israel killing its own prophets Lamentations chapter 4 verse 12 to 3 The kings of the earth and all the inhabitants of the world would not have believed that the adversary and the enemy should have entered into the gates of Jerusalem for the sins of her prophets. Okay, the prophets of Israel. And the iniquities of her priests, the sins of her priests, Israel's priests, that have shed the blood of of the just in the midst of her okay so the prophets and priests of israel have shed blood in their midst in the book of matthew 23 verse 30 to 31 and say if we had been in the days of our fathers okay israelites speaking we would not have been partakers with them in the blood of the prophets Wherefore ye be witness unto yourself that ye are the children of them which killed the prophets. Okay, so speaking to the Jews, he's saying ye are the offsprings of the fathers that killed God's prophets. In the book of Matthew 23 verse 37, O Jerusalem, Jerusalem, thou that killest the prophets, and stonest them which are sent unto thee, how often would I have gathered thy children together, even as a hen gathereth her chickens under her wings, and you would not. In the book of 1 Thessalonians 2, verse 14 to 15, For ye, brethren, became followers of the churches of God, which in Judea are in Christ Jesus. For ye also have suffered like things of your own countrymen, even as they have of the Jews, have both killed the Lord Jesus and their own prophets, and have persecuted us, and they please not God, and are contrary to all men. So not only did she kill the prophets, she also was responsible for the death of Jesus Christ. Okay, we carry on in the book of Revelations. And when I saw her, I wondered with great admiration. Okay. And the angel said to me, Wherefore didst thou marvel? And I will tell thee the mystery of the woman, and of the beast that carrieth her, which hath the seven heads and ten horns. Okay. John here, for a moment, wandered after her with great admiration. 
Based on many scriptures, Israel is the harlot who was and still fornicates with the kings of the earth. While our leaders continually jump in bed with her, the focus of the churches worldwide wonder after her, Israel. And just like John did, with great admiration. The spirit of God's jealous ex-wife has continually murdered the prophets of God and soon she will come for you and I. It seems that she or the spirit behind Israel is the religious capital of the new world order. Her writing the beast indicates that she is in control of the beast. I am not going to do a teaching about the beast that she is writing on on this video. I am just focusing on exposing who rides the beast. She controls the majority of the world, which in turn would also control most of social media and propaganda. Knowing full well that the regathering of Israel and the dry bones coming to life and the birthing of a nation in one day was verbally and also noted down on paper by King Cyrus, you would think people would automatically rule out almost every other end times teaching surrounding the current Israel, especially Ezekiel 38. But because the deception is so deep and the jealous ex-wife has put a hex on the majority of the churches because of incorrect Bible teachings, it is much harder to unlearn than it is to learn. Therefore, further study is needed. Here are the three teachings regarding Ezekiel 38 and the Gog and Magog invasions. A. Ezekiel 38 39 was fulfilled in Esther's time and not repeated in Revelations 20. Could John be using Old Testament imagery from an event in the past and applying it to a new situation he's writing about, much like he does with Jezebel, Egypt, Saddam, and Babylon? B. Ezekiel 38-39 was fulfilled in the 2nd century BC during the times of the Maccabees, Antiochus Epiphanes, and this is alluded to and echoed by John regarding Revelations 20, rather than the days of Esther. C. All the popular dispensational Schofield and Derby preach of rapture and pro-Israel view, which says Ezekiel 38 and 39 is about a Russian-led attack on modern-day Israel. Or D. Ezekiel 38 and 39 prophecy was fulfilled when Rome invaded Israel in 70 AD. I personally hold to position A. And I believe that Ezekiel 38 and 39 finds its historical fulfillment in the book of Esther. And the battle of Esther serves as a type or shadow of what will eventually be repeated we see in Revelations 20, but repeated to deceive the world. So why do I find option A to be more persuasive? The dispensational Schofer and Derby pro-Israel pre-trib rapture folk teach that Israel's surrounding enemies, led by Putin as God from the land Magog, from the southern part of the Soviet Union, Russia, will attempt to wipe out Israel and its people in the last days. In the book of Ezekiel 38 verse 11, And thou shalt say, okay, this is Gog, will say, I will go up to the land of unwarred villages. First of all, how can this be talking about the current Israel when the current Israel is surrounded by a 500 mile, 24 hour surveilled wall? How could anyone miss this pivotal simple fact when Ezekiel 38 is saying that Gog, the land of Magog, will go up to a land of unwalled villages. You would have to question other teachings they teach when using Old Testament scriptures that have already come to pass and teaching them as future. This is the deception. 
The Easter view seems to fit the timeline of the passage itself in the book of Ezekiel. Whilst in Babylon exile, Ezekiel is recording his vision of the dry bones. Ezekiel 37, which speaks of Israel's return from exile and restoration in the land, thanks to the decree of King Cyrus. The dry bones is not talking about 1948. Whilst in Babylon exile, Ezekiel writes Ezekiel 38 and 39 as a soon be or in the later days an empire that will come against Israel. That empire was Media Persia. The attack of Gog from the land made Gog comes at a time soon after this. It's a land that is restored from war and its people have been regathered from many nations. The attack of Gog from the land made Gog comes at a time soon after this. It's a land that is restored from war and its people had been gathered from many nations to the mountains of Israel which had been a continuous waste. But its people was brought out from those nations and were dwelling securely, all of them. Now let's connect the dots between Ezekiel 38 and 39 to the days of Esther and we will start in Ezekiel 38, 1 to 3. And the word of the Lord came unto me, saying, Son of man, set thy face against Gog, the land of Magog, the chief prince of Meshach and Tubal, and prophesy against him, and say, Thus saith the Lord God, Behold, I am against thee, O Gog, the chief prince of Meshach and Tubal. Now in Ezekiel, Israel's rival enemy is referred to as Gog. And Gog's goal is to come in as a storm, like a cloud covering the land against God's people, Israel. And Gog's aim is to seize spoil and carry off plunder. In the book of Esther, we are introduced to Haman, who was an enemy to all the Jews who schemed against Israel to destroy them. Okay, we see that in Esther 9.24. Now in Esther 3 verse 1, it states, After these things did King Ahasuerus promote Haman, the son of the Agagite, and advised him and set his seat above all the princes that were with him. Okay, Haman's authority became head chief over all princesses. The meaning of Gog is head of. Okay, Haman's objective was to come in like a storm against Israel, using the king's ring of approval and without the king's knowledge. Haman set out to destroy all Jews, elderly women and children in, the, in a single day. Haman's goals, actions and objectives are exactly the same as Ezekiel 38. The book of Esther tells us that Haman was an Agagite, meaning that Haman was a descendant of Agag. Agag, who was the king of the Amalekites, whose soul was supposed to kill back in 1 Samuel 15. And because of Saul's failure to kill the Amalekites, God regrets that he had made Saul king. And of course, Samuel has to finish the job by slaying Agag, the king of the Amalekites. This episode in 1 Samuel 15 gives us the background of Haman's lineage as a Agagite. He was part of the royal bloodline of Israel's ancient enemy. The Amalekites in Saul, who was supposed to kill Agag, was a son of Kish, a Benjamite, and this becomes very important when we jump into the book of Esther when Mordecai is introduced. Like Saul, Mordecai was the son of Kish, a Benjamite. Haman the Agagite is a counterpart of Agag, king of the Amalekites. Saul spears Agag, but Mordecai sees to it that the family of Haman or the Amalekites are exterminated once and for all. 
Esther and Mordecai are redeeming their name by doing what their ancestor Saul failed to do and ending the Amalekite problem once and for all. The conflict between Saul and Agag is rejoined in the book of Esther. In Numbers 24 verse 20 states that Amalek was the first of the nations but his end will be destruction and that destruction will come to the fulfillment by the hands of Queen Esther and Mordecai. After centuries of conflict, the Amalekite storyline ends in the book of Esther. Mordecai, the Jew who represented the embodiment of Israel, refused to bow down to Haman the Agagite, who represented the embodiment of Amalek. Mordecai was a descendant of King Saul, and Haman was the descendant of Agag, the king of the Amalekites. The terms Agag and Gog appear similar at face value, in fact, are equated in the Septuagint. The Septuagint is an ancient Greek translation of the Hebrew Old Testament. It was written during the New Testament period between Malachi and Matthew, and the Septuagint is quoted twice as often as the Hebrew Old Testament by the New Testament writers with this in mind. Numbers 27 verse 7 is where the key text is, and the Hebrew Bible, the verses reads as follows. The Hebrew translations in Numbers 24 verse 7. Water shall flow from Israel's buckets, and his seed shall be in many waters. His king shall be higher than Agag, and his kingdom shall be exalted. Now in the Septuagint version of Numbers 24 verse 7, it states, A man will come from his seed and prevail over many peoples, and he will be raised up higher than the kingdom of Gog. There it is, and his kingdom will increase. If it's accurate to refer Agag as Gog, in light of the Septuagint translation of Numbers 24 verse 7, then it would be equally accurate to refer an Agagite as a Gagite. And in fact, some Septuagint manuscripts do just this, refer to Haman as a Gagite instead of an Agagite in Esther 3, 1 and in Esther 9, 24 specifically. In other words, the terms Agagite and Gagite are interchangeable. The book of Ezekiel 38 tells us that this Gog is of the land of Magog. Now, the dispensational pro-Israel Schofield and Derby preacher of rapture folk have been teaching that Magog is referring to the geographical location in the southern part of the Soviet Union. Regarding the land of Magog, Ezekiel wasn't expecting his readers at his time to peer into the future of Russia, which didn't even exist yet in their time. Rather, Ezekiel was expanding his current viewers to reach into the past to recall the table of nations in Genesis chapter 10. This is the list of original nations that descended from Noah's three sons. And notice that Magog is in that first grouping of nations among the direct descendants of Japheth, as well as Meshach and Tubal. Gog's allies we see in Ezekiel 38. Ezekiel is taking its readers all the way back to the very first nations after the flood and informing them that Gog's lineage can be traced there. Numbers 24.20 tells us that Amalek was the first of the nations but his end shall be destruction making the connection between Haman the Agagite in the book of Esther. Haman represents the ancient spiritual struggle between Amalek and Israel. The Amalekites were descendants of Magog, the son of Japheth. 
In the book of Ezekiel 38:17, it states, Thus said the Lord God, Art thou he who I have spoken in old time by my servants, the prophets of Israel, which prophesied in those days many years that I would bring thee against them? Okay, it's talking about the hook into the jaw. This was prophesied beforehand. Here is the Septuagint version. Ezekiel 38, 17 again. Thus said the Lord God to Gog, Thou art he concerning whom I spoke in former times by the hand of my servants, the prophets of Israel, in those days and years, and I would bring thee up against them. And see the difference there? Ezekiel's readers would have been more familiar with Gog. They would have read about Gog from the former prophets of Israel and not confused with a futuristic Russia that didn't exist in their time nor mentioned. The first war between Israel and Gog or Amalek is found in Exodus 17 verse 16. It's an ancient ongoing war that would eventually see its end. In the book of Exodus 17, 16, For he said, Because the Lord hath sworn that the Lord will have war with Amalek from generation to generation. Haman, the enemy and adversary of the Jews in the book of Esther, was an Agagite, a term that's the same as Gogite. And the Agagite are the royal bloodline of the Amalekites who were the descendants of Magog and of whom God himself swore to have war with from generation to generations. Gog is called the chief prince of Meshach and Tubal. This is where the dispensational Schofield and Derby pre-trip movement makes the Russian connection. The word translated chief as in chief prince, is the Hebrew word Rosh. And they think that Rosh sounds like Russia. And so the connection is made. That's the only thought put into it. It surely sounds like the spirit of this jealous ex-wife is behind this false movement, wanting to use the Ezekiel 38 passage to help justify the murdering of thousands of innocent lives to gain land that God already took from Israel. The Hebrew word for chief is Rosh. Rosh means chief head, beginning or source. Hence the chief prince. So what this means is that Gog is the chief prince of Meshach and Tubal. It doesn't mean Rosh is a place name or people group. There is no place name Rosh known in the entire ancient world period. It is not a place name. And who was the head chief of Media Persia? Haman was. We carry on in the book of Ezekiel 38, we are at verse 4. And I will turn thee back and put hooks into thy jaws, and I will bring thee forth and all thine army, horses and horsemen, all of them clothed with all sorts of armour, even a great company with bucklers and shields, all of them handling swords. Okay, regarding the hook through the jaw of Gog, to draw them to battle against Israel. Here's another verse not regarding the name Gog this time round, but by the name Leviathan. In the book of Job 41 verse 1 to 2, Canst thou draw out Leviathan with an hook, or his tongue with a cord which thou lettest down? Canst thou put an hook into his nose, or bore his jaw through with a thorn. The dispensational Schofield and Derby pre-trip teachers teach that the weapons or horses and horsemen, bucklers and shields, handling swords, they teach are current modern weapons. 
they teach that horses and horsemen are helicopters and planes and bow and arrows are launches and missiles. These words horses and horsemen, armor bucklers and shields, swords are indeed exactly what they were in the days of Esther. We carry on in the book of Ezekiel we're at verse 5. Persia, Ethiopia and Libya with them, all of them were shield and helmet, Goma and all his bands and the house of Togoma and of the north quarters and all his bands and many people with thee. Be thou prepared and prepare for thyself, thou and all thy company that are assembled unto thee and be thou a guard unto them. After many days thou shalt be visited in the later years thou shalt come into the land that is brought back from the sword, okay, from exile, and is gathered out of many people against the mountains of Israel, which have been always waste, but it is brought forth out of the nations, and they shall dwell safely, all of them. Okay, this is evident that this Gog battle, after many days or later years, or what is soon to come because Ezekiel is writing this whilst in Babylon exile. This is not talking about these current days, but soon after Israel is regathered to her land and dwelling safely within unwarred villages, which happened soon after the Babylonian exile. We carry on in verse 9. Thou shalt ascend and come like a storm, thou shalt be like a cloud to cover the land, thou and all thy bands, and, and many people with thee. Thus saith the Lord God, it shall also come to pass, that at that time, at that same time, shall things come into thy mind, and thou shalt think an evil thought, and thou shalt say, who? Gog will say, I will go up to the land of unwarred villages. I will go to them that are at rest, that dwell safely, all of them dwelling without walls, and having neither bars nor gates. Gog of Magog will attempt to attack Israel that has no walls and no gates, when the current Israel is protected by a 500 mile long wall called the West Bank Barrier. Again. This alone should cancel out Gog and Magog being current. But the question is, is it enough to convince you? In the book of Esther 9.19, Therefore the Jews of the villages that dwelt in the unwarred towns made the fourteenth day of the month Adar a day of gladness and feasting and a good day and of sending portions to one another. Okay, unwarred towns. Even in Zechariah chapter 2 verse 4 to 5 wrote in the text that Jerusalem will be inhabited without walls and a wall of fire will protect Israel which is symbolic for God will be their wall and will protect Israel. We have to understand that without Esther, the Amalekites would have wiped out the Jewish people instead of the other way around. The line of David would have been cut off and the Messiah would have never come. In other words, the actions of Esther changed the course of history and we are all here today because the Jewish people weren't wiped out. The line of David was not cut off. The seed of Abraham was not cut off and Genesis 3.15, the woman's seed was not cut off as well. Once Esther uncovered and revealed Haman's entire plot to annihilate the Jews, Esther points to Haman and declares before the king a foe and an enemy is this wicked Haman. And Haman became terrified before the king and the queen and then on the gallows of his own house, which Haman constructed to hang Mordecai, the king declares, hang Haman on it. 
After this, the king grants the Jews the right to assemble, to defend themselves, and to annihilate the entire army of those who set out to annihilate them. And they did. We carry on in the book of Ezekiel 38, we're at verse 12. To take a spoil and to take a prey, to turn thine hand upon the desolate places that are now inhabited and upon the people that are gathered out of the nations, which have gotten cattle and goods that dwell in the midst of the land, Sheba and Dedan, and the merchants of Tarshish, with all the young lions thereof, shall say unto thee, Art thou come to take spoil? Hast thou gathered thy company to take prey? Hast thou gathered thy company to take a prey, to carry away silver and gold, to take away cattle and goods, to take a great spoil? We see this in Esther 3.13, Haman's desire to take a spoil. In the book of Ezra, we are told that the Jewish exiles who returned to Israel under King Cyrus' decree brought with them an enormous amount of silver and gold, along with goods and cattle. These are the exact items mentioned by Ezekiel in the Gog and Magog prophecy. Uh, Zechariah chapter 2 verse 4 also backs this. The Schofield and Derby preacher, prose or dispensationalists not only teach that the arrows we see in Ezekiel 38 are ballistic missiles or modern day warfare, and horses and horsemen are planes and helicopters, they also teach that livestock and cattle actually means oil and natural gas. You can see the desperation here mimicking scripture that were already fulfilled to help justify the killings of thousands of innocent lives to deceive the churches who also agree with the onslaught. We carry on in Ezekiel 38, we're at verse 14. Therefore, son of man, prophesy and say unto Gog, Thus saith the Lord Gog, In that day when my people of Israel dwelleth safely, thou shalt not know it, and thou shalt come from thy place out of the north parts. Thou and many people with thee, all of them riding upon horses, a great company and a mighty army. The north as in the north from Israel, the dispensationalists teach is Russia, which dispensationalists say is their trump card. When ancient Israelites heard terms like the north or the remote parts of the north, they would have thought of the direction from which their foes historically attacked. For example, when prophesying about the Babylonian invasion, that Jeremiah chapter 4 verse 6 says, I'm bringing evil from the north and with great destruction. But Babylon was to the east of Jerusalem. So how could an invasion from the east be described as God bringing evil from the north? As most of us recognize is that the north doesn't typically refer to the origin of Israel's attackers but to the trajectory of their attackers. It makes more sense for Nebuchadnezzar to avoid routing his army through a vast desert, but to go up and around instead, and then descend upon Jerusalem from the north. If this was a case for Nebuchadnezzar from Babylon, it would have been more so the case for Haman and his forces coming from Persia, which was even further east than Babylon. So the direction of the attack, the north, the goal of the attack, gold, silver and cattle, the Jews situation, dwelling securely in unwalled villages, the time of the attack itself, the later days from Ezekiel's perspective, not long after Israel is returned to her land and are dwelling safely. The nations involved in the attack, all Persians, the weapons used in this attack, 
ancient weapons, not modern weapons. The identification of the attacker, the chief prince of the Persian nations. The attacker, Haman. Now we carry on in the book of um, Ezekiel 38, we're at verse 16. And thou shalt come up against my people Israel as a cloud to cover the land, and it shall be in the later days. And I will bring thee against my land, that the heathen may know me. And when I shall be sanctified in thee, O Gog, therefore their eyes, thus saith the Lord God, art thou he of whom I have spoken in old time by my servants, the prophets of Israel? which prophesied in those days many years that I would bring thee against them. And it shall come to pass at the same time when Gog shall come against the land of Israel, saith the Lord God, that my fury shall come up in my face. For in my jealousy and in the fire of my wrath have I spoken. Surely in that day there shall be a great shaking in the land of Israel so that the fishes of the sea and the fowls of heaven and the beasts of the field and all creeping things they creep upon the earth and all the men that are upon the face of the earth shall shake at my presence and the mountains shall be thrown down and the and the steep places shall fall and every wall shall fall to the ground and i will call for a sword against them throughout all my mountains saith the lord god every man's sword shall be against his brother and I will plead against him with pestilence and with blood. And I will rain upon him and upon his bands, and upon the many people that are with him, an overflowing rain and great hailstones, fire and brimstone. Thus will I magnify myself and sanctify myself, and I will be known in the eyes of many nations, and they shall know that I am the Lord. God wins this battle between Gog and Israel. This is evident that Ezekiel 38 and 39 is not talking about Antiochus Epiphanes in the 2nd century, nor is it talking about the Romans in 70 AD. Because Antiochus Epiphanes and the Romans succeeded, when it clearly states that Gog of Magog will not succeed. And we carry on in, in the book of Ezekiel, we're at verse 11. And it shall come to pass in that day that I will give unto Gog a place there of graves in Israel, the valley of the passengers on the east of the sea. And it shall stop the noses of the passengers. And there shall they bury Gog in all his multitude, and they shall call it the Valley of Hamon Gog. In this passage, the place where the army of Gog is buried will be known as the Valley of Hamon Gog. The word Hamon in Ezekiel is spelled in Hebrew is almost exactly like Haman. In Hebrew, both words have the same trilateral root, H M N if you were to transliterate it into English. So only the vowels are different. Why is this significant? It's because vowels weren't added until somewhere between 700 and 1000 AD. Either way, Ezekiel's writing over a thousand years before vowels even existed in the Hebrew language. What this means is that when an ancient Jew read the books of Ezekiel and Esther, the names Haman and Haman would have been the exact same word. Now, how is Ezekiel 38 different from Revelations 20, 7 to 10? John seems to be using Old Testament imagery from an event in the past and applying it to the new situation he's writing about, much like he does with Jezebel, Egypt, Sodom and Babylon. Yes, the same story about Gog and Magog is mentioned here, but it's the mimicking and using what's already come to pass that makes it different and deceiving. In the book of Revelations 20, verse 7 to 10, And when the thousand years are expired, Satan shall be loosed out of his prison. 
okay, and shall go out to deceive the nations which are in the four quarters of the earth. Now, what will Satan use or mimic to deceive the whole world, to deceive all the nations in the four quarters of the earth? We carry on. Gog and Magog. We already see Satan mimicking the regathering nation of Israel in 1948. A nation born in one day and the dry bones coming to life and now mimicking the Gog and Magog invasion that was already fulfilled in Esther's day. It took Satan decades of brainwashing through incorrect history books and incorrect Bible teachings to ultimately bring the world's focus on that one tree amongst many trees in that forest, Israel. Just as it says here in verse 8, and shall go out to deceive the nations which are in the four quarters of the earth using the Gog and Magog teaching to gain approval and empathy from the apostate churches to accept and applaud Israel's genocidal rampage into Palestine and over time that genocidal rampage would spread to gain more land for the people of Israel who are clearly deceived into thinking that the promises between God and Abraham is still active which in turn justifying the slaughtering of innocent lives and bulldozing many Palestinian homes because to them they are building God's kingdom here on earth. First of all, God's kingdom is not of this world and is not created using the blood of the innocent. Therefore, the kingdom they are expanding in Israel is the Antichrist capital of the world, which was clearly birthed out of the pockets of the Rothschilds. John 18.36 Jesus answered, My kingdom is not of this world. If my kingdom were of this world, then would my servants fight that I should not be delivered to the Jews? But now is my kingdom not from hence. We carry on in the book of Revelations. To gather them together to battle, the number of whom is as the sand of the sea. And they went up on the breadth of the earth encompassed the camp of the saints about and the beloved city and fire came down from God out of heaven and devoured them okay we know that this was already fulfilled in Esther's day we carry on in the book of revelations we're at verse 10 and the devil that deceived them was cast into the lake of fire and brimstone where the beast and the false prophet are and shall be tormented day and night for ever and ever. Now the devil, the spirit of the Zionist jealous ex-wife that deceived the majority of the churches, who has fornicated with the kings of the earth, who was still riding the beast, mimicking what has already come to pass and fulfilled in Esther's day, killing the prophets and also led by an example to the whole world regarding the abomination. Just like John was so fixated on her, so were the churches. So focused on Israel, so focused on that forbidden tree, they received the abomination. She will soon be cast into the lake of fire. In the book of Revelations 18.20, it states, Rejoice over her, thou heaven, and ye holy apostles and prophets, for God hath revenged you on her. Okay, in order to control the whole world, there cannot be any oppositions. Satan and his minions knew full well what nations would stand in their way to achieve total dominance of the world and they couldn't just go and slaughtering innocent lives without a false biblical excuse without using propaganda without the approval of the apostate churches and wouldn't like it if the whole world stood up against them 
So they had to use the Gog and Magog story to twist words that sound like Russia, twist ancient weaponry to be modern weaponry. Comparing Gog to Putin and using Putin's allies, Turkey and Iran, to fit into their Gog and Magog invasion, when these nations are the very nations they knew full well would stand in their way of total dominance of the world. Here's a perfect example to explain and also to confirm the teaching that I'm teaching regarding using the Gog and Magog as an excuse to overtake lands and to eliminate people. Before the invasion of Iraq, George Bush tried to talk French President Jacques Chirac into supporting the invasion of Iraq. Chirac accounts that the American leader appealed to their common faith, Christianity, and told him Gog and Magog are at work in the Middle East. The biblical prophecies are being fulfilled. This confrontation is willed by God, who wants to use this conflict to erase his people's enemies before a new age begins. Can you see how the kings of the earth, who are in bed with the harlot, are using Ezekiel 38, the Gog and Magog, as an excuse to motivate other leaders to murder innocent lives. You could just imagine the urgent support of the churches when anyone points out any nation when compared to Gog and Magog. The first thing that comes to mind in the hearts of the apostate churches is approval to murder by saying in their hearts, bless Israel, pray for Israel, and the destruction of Israel's enemies. Another scenario, just recently. You must remember what Amalek has done to you, says our Holy Bible, and we do remember and we are fighting our brave troops and combatants who are now in Gaza or around Gaza and in all other regions in Israel are joining this chain of Jewish heroes, a chain that has started 3,000 years ago from Joshua Ben Nun until the heroes of 1948, the Six Day War, the 70 3 October war and all other wars in this country are hero troops they have one supreme main goal to completely defeat the murderous enemy and to guarantee our existence in this country we've always said never again never again is now Benjamin Netanyahu uses the biblical story of Amalek we see in 1 Samuel 15, 1 to 3. A teaching we just finished regarding Haman, who was from the line of King Agag, who was an Amalekite, a war that had already met its end in the days of Esther. Benjamin Netanyahu is using what has already come to pass to justify their current slaughtering of innocent men and women, kids and babies in Gaza. But the only reason why God ordered Israel to slaughter and have no pity on these nations, the Canaanites, the Hittites, the Amorites, the Perizzites, the Hevites, the Jebusites, including Amalek or the Amalekites, because it was prophesied that Amalek would see its doom and because these were Nephilim Gentile nations. It is not classified murder when ending the life of a Nephilim. And of course, the churches would fall into this deception and pray Israel defeats its enemies because they don't understand or teach Nephilim in their churches. And they don't understand that the Gog and Magog was fulfilled in Esther's time. Infallible teachings about the Gentile nations is found on part two.
Her favourite weapon, the dispensational Freemason Schofield and Darby, pro-Israel, pre-trib rapture false doctrine, who teach that 1948 fulfills the regathering of Israel, teach that the bloodline of the Israelites is still active when the Bible clearly teaches the opposite still teach its congregations to bless and focus on the current Israel for end times events. Example, a rebuilt third temple that the Antichrist will stand in, followed up by the abomination, the literal right hand and forehead lie. They still teach its congregations the Gog and Magog lie, applauding Israel's actions to slaughter over 30,000 innocent lives in Gaza, and still teach its congregation that the very first sign before any of that happens is the sign of the rapture. Now that we know what the abomination is, and we know the correct season we are in, it has become very simple to understand verses dispensationalists use to justify their interpretation of scripture regarding their pre-rapture lie. But first, let's get an understanding what the ultimate wrath of God is. In the book of Revelations 14, 9-10, it states, and the third angel followed them, saying with a loud voice, If any man worship the beast and his image, and receives his mark in his forehead, or in his hand, the same shall drink the wine of the wrath of God, which is poured out without mixture into the cup of his indignation. And he shall be tormented with fire and brimstone, in the presence of the holy angels, and in the presence of the Lamb. According to this verse, the wrath of God, without a shadow of doubt, is the abomination. The abomination is much worse than any earthquakes, World War Three, economic collapse, civil wars, and a so-called pandemic, because the abomination puts an end to grace. Here are some verses dispensationalists use to justify their interpretation of a pre rapture. In the book of Matthew 24 verse 40 to 41, quote, Then shall two be in the field, the one shall be taken and the other left. Two women shall be grinding at the mill, the one shall be taken and the other left. Dispensationalists teach that the ones taken first is the rapture of the saints. But this is not talking about the rapture. These verses is talking about those who have taken the abomination. In the book of Matthew 13, verse 30, quote, Let both grow together until the harvest. And in the time of harvest, I will say to the reapers, Gather ye together first the tears, and bind them in bundles to burn them. But gather the wheat into my barn. So it is the tears, those who have taken the abomination, that are gathered first. In the book of Revelation 3 verse 10, it states, Because thou hast kept the word of my patience, I also will keep thee from the hour of temptation, which shall come upon all the world, to try them that dwell upon the earth. Now the dispensationalists teach that the word keep means raptured. God will rapture his church out before the hour of temptation. Now just recently, what was the greatest temptation that came upon the whole earth? Just recently, what threatened the livelihoods of mankind worldwide? That's right, the abomination was that temptation. In the book of Psalms 91 verse 10 to 11, it states, There shall no evil before thee, neither shall any plague come nigh thy dwelling. For he shall give his angels charge over thee, to keep thee, in all thy ways. 
Now the abomination is the plague, and those who refused it, God kept from it. Confirmation in the book of Revelation 15 verse 2 states, And I saw as it were a sea of glass mingled with fire, and them that had gotten the victory over the beast, and over his image, and over his mark, and over the number of his name, stand on the sea of glass, having the harps of God. Again, confirmation in 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 4. But ye, brethren, are not in darkness, that that day, or the abomination, should overtake you as a thief. In the book of Revelation 6, verse 17, For the great day of his wrath is come, that is, past tense. And who shall be able to stand? In other words, who is able to endure life without the mark? In the book of Philippines, chapter 1, verse 29, states, For unto you it is given in the behalf of Christ, not only to believe on him, but also to suffer for his sake. So we are to suffer for his sake, not to escape suffering. How else are we to be refined or made ready? In the book of 1 Thessalonians chapter 1 verse 2, quote, And to wait for his Son from heaven, whom he raised from the dead, even Jesus, which delivered us from the wrath to come. Now the dispensationalists teach that the word delivered in this verse means raptured out. But what it actually means is to deliver us from his wrath, the abomination. Okay, in the book of Matthew 10, 22, And ye shall be hated of all men for my name's sake, but he that endureth to the end shall be saved. Endureth, not raptured out. In the book of Luke 21, verse 35 to 36, quote, For as a snare shall it come on all of them that dwell on the face of the whole earth. Watch ye therefore and pray always that ye may be accounted worthy to escape all these things that shall come to pass and to stand before the Son of Man. Now, the dispensationalists also teach that the word escape in this verse means raptured out, to escape the tribulation period. Now, the meaning of snare is trap, it's deception. Recently, what snare came upon the whole earth? That's right, the abomination. Who escaped it? Those who refused it. In the book of 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 9, for God hath not appointed us to wrath, but to obtain salvation by our Lord Jesus Christ. Now, the dispensationalists teach that God's true believers will not take part in the seven-year tribulation. They will be raptured out before the tribulation starts. But the true meaning is that those who refuse the abomination were not appointed unto his wrath. In the book of John 17, verse 15, Quote, I pray not that thou shouldest take them out of the world, but thou shouldest keep them from the evil. Okay, I pray not thou shouldest take or rapture them out of the world, but thou shouldest protect them from the abomination. The abomination is evil. The majority of the church is taught a very popular dispensational preacher false teaching. But my Bible tells me that truth is not popular. Truth is unpopular. In the book of Matthew chapter 7 verse 13 to 15, quote, Enter ye at the straight gate, for wide or popular is the gate, and broad is the way that leadeth to destruction, and many there be which go in thereat. Because straight is the gate, and narrow, unpopular, is the way which leadeth unto life, and few there be that find it. 
Beware of false prophets which come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly they are ravening wolves. So the dispensational, pre-trib rapture folk, pro-Israel, their teaching is the most popular teaching in all the churches worldwide. Noah and his family were delivered, kept, set aside, protected. They stood their ground. They didn't let those days overtake them. They endured. They remained the only ones left. They escaped. And the same goes for Lot and the Israelites, who had the Lamb's blood on their doorposts. They were kept. They escaped. They were delivered from God's wrath in those days. Unfortunately, the majority of the churches took the abomination because they followed the dispensational Freemasons, Schofield and Derby, pro-Israel, pre trib rapture teachings, her choice of weapon. Jerusalem above, not below. 2 Corinthians 4.18 While we look not at the things which are seen, but at the things which are not seen, for the things which are seen are temporal, but the things which are not seen are eternal. Why are the majority of the churches focusing on a slice of real estate in Israel here on earth? In the book of Galatians chapter 4 verse 25 to 26 state, For this Edgar is Mount Sinai in Arabia, and answereth to Jerusalem which now is and is in bondage with her children. But Jerusalem, which is above, is free, which is the mother of us all. If the blind Jews were in bondage because the majority of them refused the new covenant gospel of Jesus Christ, that would mean that the majority of the churches who look to earthly Jerusalem are also in bondage and are not free. In the book of Colossians chapter 3 verse 1 to 2 state, If ye then be risen with Christ, seek those things which are above, where Christ sitteth on the right hand of God. Set your affections on things above, not on things on the earth. Again, seek those things which is above, not on earthly things. Jerusalem. In the book of Philippines chapter 3 verse 20, For our conversation is in heaven, from hence also we look for the Saviour, the Lord Jesus Christ. So our conversation should not be about earthly Jerusalem, our conversation should only be about heavenly Jerusalem. In the book of Luke 21 verse 28 state, and when these things begin to come to pass, then look up and lift your heads, for your redemption draweth nigh. Okay, so don't seek things that are down here on earth, only things that are above. Look up. In the book of John 18 verse 36, quote, Jesus answered, My kingdom is not of this world. If my kingdom were of this world, then would my servants fight, that I should not be delivered to the Jews. But now is my kingdom not from hence. Now, we now know the outcome of those who focused on her, Israel, below. The majority were hexed by her teachings, which ultimately led the majority of the apostate churches to the abomination. Spiritual Israel In the book of Romans 2, verse 28 to 29 For he is not a Jew which is one outwardly, neither is that circumcision which is outwardly in the flesh. But he, who, Jesus Christ, is a Jew which is one inwardly, and circumcision is that of the heart, in the spirit, and not in the letter, whose praise is not of men, but of God. Knowing full well that before God's chosen bloodline got the title Jew, they had the title Hebrew. 
The meaning of the spiritual Jew obviously is, has nothing to do with anything literal, ethnicity or circumcision of the flesh, but a change, circumcising or cutting off all covenant ways. Let's get some verses to clarify. In the book of Romans chapter 11 verse 26 to 27, quote, And so all Israel shall be saved, as it is written, there shall come out of Sion a deliverer, okay, that's Jesus Christ, and shall turn away ungodliness from Jacob. For this is my covenant unto them, when I shall take away their sins. Okay, every spiritual Jew, whether Jew or Gentile, nothing to do with ethnicity, a spiritual Jew is anyone that accepts the new covenant gospel of Jesus Christ. In the book of Romans 9, 6-7, quote, Not as though the word of God had taken none effect, for they are not all Israel which are of Israel, neither because they are the seed of Abraham, are they all children, but an Isaac shall thy seed be called. So after the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ, the new covenant gospel of Jesus Christ had no effect on the blind majority of the Jews because of their unbelief. In their minds, their bloodline from Abraham was still active, still a peculiar people set aside only for God, an earthly Israel. In order for a person who thinks they are still ethnic Jew to become a spiritual Jew, one would have to first have faith, acknowledgement that Jesus Christ is the Messiah, and accept the fact that the titles Jew and Gentile are no longer titles anymore. Jew or Gentile are the children of Abraham through faith. In the book of Galatians 3, 6 to 7, quote, Even as Abraham believed God, it was accounted to him for righteousness. Know ye therefore that they which are of faith, the same are the children of Abraham. In the book of Galatians 3.29, quote, And if ye be Christ, then are ye Abraham's seed, and his according to the promise. In the book of Colossians 3.11, quote, Where there is neither Greek nor Jew, circumcision nor uncircumcision, barbarian Scythian, bond nor free, but Christ is all and in all. In the eyes of God there is no skin colour, Greek, Jew or Gentile. These titles have been obsolete since the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ. Literal circumcision is now obsolete and spiritual circumcision is needed for salvation. In the same manner, it's no longer about a literal ethnic Israel from the line of Abraham anymore. It's about the spiritual Israelite by faith in the new covenant gospel of Jesus Christ. In the book of Romans chapter 11 verse 7, And if some of the branches be broken off, and thou being a wild olive tree, okay, talking about the Gentiles, were grafted in among them, and with them partakers of the root and fatness of the olive tree. Those that call themselves ethnic Israel are not spiritual Israel. Why are they not accepting the fact that Gentiles are now grafted in, causing much division and grief? In the book of Ephesians chapter 2 verse 11 to 19 state, Wherefore remember that ye being in time past Gentiles in the flesh, who are called uncircumcision by that which is called the circumcision in the flesh by hands, that at that time ye, the Gentile, were without Christ, being aliens from the commonwealth of Israel, and strangers from the covenants of promise, having no hope, and without God in the world, but now, in Christ Jesus, ye who sometimes were afar off, are made nigh by the blood of Christ. For he is our peace, who hath made both, Jew and Gentile, one, 
and hath broken down the middle wall of partition between us, having abolished in his flesh, okay, on the cross, the enmity, the division, the separation, even the law of commandments contained in ordinances, for to make in himself, who? Jesus Christ, of twain, Jew and Gentile, one new man. So making peace. The main reason why there is no peace in the Middle East is because she refuses the new covenant gospel of Jesus Christ. We carry on. Verse 16. And that he, Jesus Christ, might reconcile both Jew and Gentile unto God in one body by the cross. Okay. By his death and resurrection. Having slain the enmity, the division, the separation, the favoritism, thereby. Both Jew and Gentile into one body, not two separate bodies. And came and preached peace to you, the Gentile, which were afar off, and to them, the Jews, that were nigh. For through him, Jesus Christ, we both... Jew and Gentile have access by one spirit unto the Father. Now, therefore, ye are no more strangers and foreigners, but fellow citizens with the saints and of the household of God. So why does Israel treat their neighbors like foreigners? In the book of Ephesians, chapter 3, verse 3 to 6, quote, how that by revelation he had made known unto me the mystery, as I wrote afore in few words, whereby when ye read, ye may understand my knowledge in the mystery of Christ, which in other ages was not made known unto the sons of men, and it is now revealed unto his holy apostles and the prophets by the Spirit that the Gentiles should be fellow hears and of the same body and partakers of his promise in Christ by the gospel. The focus of Israel is so strong upon those who say they love Jesus Christ. So much so, they are willing to bypass all that Jesus Christ has taught them to love thy neighbor. Even John, for a moment, marveled over her, Israel, with great admiration. In the book of Revelations 18, verse 4, quote, And I heard another voice from heaven saying, Come out of her, my people, that ye be not partakers of her sins, and that ye receive not of her plagues. Don't be partakers of Israel in justifying the slaughtering of its neighbors. Those who admired her were ripe to receive the abomination. Israel has been deceived into thinking that they are fighting God's war and the evangelical movement, as usual, are following suit because they've got their eyes set on Israel. Both movements seem to think that vengeance is theirs and don't realize that this patriotism movement of vengeance and hate towards those that govern them is in fact empowering Antichrist Trump, who is the ultimate wolf in sheep's clothing. Vengeance is the Lord's. His vengeance has already started. The abomination. The same spirit that tried to kill baby Moses, the same spirit that lured many Israelites to have offsprings to Nephilim, the same spirit that fornicates with the leaders of the world, the same spirit that killed the prophets of God, the same spirit that tried to kill the Hebrews when escaping Egypt, 
the same spirit that continually battled with the Israelites, the same spirit that tried to kill baby Jesus, the same Pharisaic spirit that killed Jesus, the same spirit that refuses the new covenant of Jesus Christ, the same spirit that mimics what has already been fulfilled, the same spirit that's behind the dispensational pro-Israel pre-trib rapture, the same spirit who hates all Gentiles and considers them as dogs, the same spirit behind the Zionists, the same spirit we currently see happening in Gaza, and the same spirit behind the abomination. She is stuck in her old ways. She has kept the partition wall up in her heart that Jesus Christ painfully pulled down through his death and resurrection. With innocent blood, she has expanded her kingdom that once was occupied by the Palestinians. She will do anything to get her milk and honey back, and in her heart, she will build back better and live deliciously. She continually hates the new bride that consists of both Jew and Gentile, and she refuses not to play a favoritized ethnic role like she used to in her youth. In the book of Revelations 18 verse 7, how much she hath glorified herself and lived deliciously. So much torment and sorrow give her, for she saith in her heart, I sit as a queen, and I am no widow, and shall see no sorrow.